Jello Dilli, onwards to Delhi. That was their battle cry. More than that, it was an expression of pain for a long sought after dream. A dream of freedom for India. Give me blood and I'll give you freedom, he had said. And from Singapore, on that overcast July day in 1943, the Azad Hind Fauj would begin its march to Delhi. They would reach Imphal, and for the first time, the Indian flag would flutter proudly in the Indian sky. Yet the moment of triumph would be fleeting. In the jungles of Burma, the forgotten army would make one last stand, and their dream was to shatter in the pain of defeat. More than half a century later, some of them returned. the Azad Hind expedition would retrace that historic march. This is the story of those who returned. Standing 5,000 feet above sea level, Mount Popa rises dramatically out of what geographers call the dry belt. According to legend, there was an enormous tremor in the 5th century BC, and Mount Popa, the sacred mountain of Burma, emerged out of the central plains. By the third week of February 1945, the British 14th Army had crossed the Irrawaddy. General Slim was well aware of the impact the monsoons would have on the advance of his army. So he wanted to provoke the decisive battle for Burma well short of Rangoon. His target lay 70 miles south of Mandalay, the Japanese administrative center, Maiktila. General Slim compared Maiktila to the wrist of a hand whose extended fingers were the Japanese lines of supply and communication. Crush that wrist, he said, and no blood will flow through the fingers. The whole hand will be paralyzed. The Japanese resistance would collapse and he would be in Rangoon before the rains. But the only direct metal road from Bagar to Maiktila passed through Chaukpadang. And 50 miles before Maiktila, it passed through the looming shadow of Mount Popa. It was to deny General William Slim the use of this vital road that Shanawaz Khan, Prem Kumar Segal, and Gurbaksh Singh Dhillon came to Mount Popa towards the end of February 1945. After all, they had to fulfill Netaji's call to pay freedom's price by preventing the advance of the British, if only for a short while. This is Mount Popa, our last stand against the British forces was here where some of the bloodiest battles were fought to defend this strategic mountain. It was here that our headquarters were located. It was here that Shanwaz, Segal and I came together and it was because of our actions at this place that we were tried together in the Red Fort of Delhi for waging war against His Majesty the King Emperor. The battle had been lost at the Irrawaddy, but not the spirit of the INA, and Colonel Dillon and his men were ready for what would be the final chapter in the Burmese war. The most memorable day 
for me was the 17th of February 1945 when I withdrew from Bagan and had arrived here. On the 18th, Colonel Sagal came up with his 2nd Infantry Regiment and he gave me the command of Chok Badang area and himself held Popa. Colonel Seigel had come up from Rangoon to take command. He arrived on the morning of the 18th. The INA's last stand at Popa was to have a lasting effect on him. Lakshmi Seigel, who married him after the war, remembers the stories he used to tell. On the top of a hill, Colonel Prem Kumar Seigel found a little Buddha. He placed the statue in a cave and he decided to make that his headquarters. He believed that it was this Buddha who protected him during those difficult days. Colonel Dillon attempts to retrace the path to this cave. He last walked on these jungle tracks 50 years ago. His steps may have slowed, but his determination remains unchanged. This is the place. This is the place where our headquarters was. This is the place where Buddha protected us. No commander could ask for a better air raid shelter or a trench than this. Oh, how wonderful, how wonderful. It is still the same after half a century. The INA soldiers operating from this cave would ensure that a lighted candle was always placed under the Buddha. This cave sheltered our headquarters during the bloodiest days of February, March, and April 1945. It was here that we had our first aid center. Our serious patients could be treated here. And after battles, we could write orders during the night without fear of the air raids or the artillery bombardment. Enemy was supreme in the air and they had, had artillery. We didn't have any gun. We didn't have even uh, machine guns at that time. And this was uh, a boon to us. Today, when I come to this place after half a century, I cannot help bowing to Lord Buddha, thanking to the people of Popa how they helped us. I bow to this place. As she places a candle here to the memory of her husband, the past catches up with Lakshmi Saigal. Suddenly, the stories her husband had told for decades begin to unfold here with fresh life. Until the very end, he had cherished his memories of the last stand at Popa. I was never here, but of all his war experiences, I felt that the battle of Mount Popa and surrounding areas, and the time he spent in Popa 
in his headquarter were the most memorable and significant time of Colonel Seigel's life. He was never tired of telling us about the Battle of Popa and of all the dangers they suffered and about the magnificent sacrifices made by some of his officers and men. He used to tell, about, tell us about it so much that when I was expecting my first child, I laughingly told him, I'm sure if it's a boy, you would like to call him Popa. So he said, that would be a wonderful idea. But fortunately, we had a daughter whom we called Subhashidi. Colonel Dillon's responsibility was to carry out extensive and persistent guerrilla raids in the areas between Popa and Chaukpadang in the east, and as far forward towards the Irrawaddy as possible. The INA's objective was to squeeze Slim's supply lines by denying him the use of the Niau Mike Tiller metal road as a supply line for reinforcements to his troops fighting the Battle of Mike Tiller. This was the site of one of the bloodiest battles in Popa region. This is the road which connected Nyangu and Bagan with Mektila and Mount Popa. I had orders to deny the British this road, use of this road, so that they could not take Mount Popa for attacking Mektila. I was successful in withholding it up to 13th of April, 1945. During one of these operations, at Tauza village on that road, there occurred the incident that is described in the INA's history as the charge of the immortals. Even a British military intelligence report was forced to concede. The men of the INA were fighting British equipment aircraft, guns and tanks, with rifles, bullet carts and empty stomachs. The story of Mount Popa and Chokbadang area will be incomplete without telling the story of this little dry pond which was broader and the bushes and crops weren't there at that time when Gyan Singh Bhisht, a company commander with only 98 men, had ordered to check the enemy advancing on this road coming from Bagan on to Chok Badan. One day, the 16th of March, 1945, 13 tanks, 11 armored cars, and 10 loaded uh, trucks of men advanced. He had orders to stop the enemy at all cost, which he did to the best of his ability. When they, they had no ammunition left, then Gyan Singh Bhishti's men, they got onto the tanks. The tanks people and the others had to debus and hand-to-hand -hand fight ensued. In that, we had lost 40 lives and an equal number of the enemy. This was one of the fiercest fights of the battle. When Gyan Singh Bhisht was replanning his men and giving out orders, a bomb hit him in the head and he s fell down, never to give out orders again. He was one of my bravest men and I miss him even today after 50 years. The guerrilla operations depended to a great extent on support from the Burmese people, not only for intelligence and shelter, but for food and water. He may be able to 
Delos. Colonel Dillon comes upon one such village, Gouin Beu, and tries to find someone who might remember him. A soldier can't ever forget those who helped him survive during his days on the battlefield. These villages, this is Guabenu. This village helped us a lot. My ration distributing distribution during the night was done on the road here. And the headman was very, very kind to me. You see, the, all these people were Minglava. Minglava. Ha 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 ha. Ask her whose uh, that house is. Is the owner there? We can go and see him. He is about 50 or 60 years old. Oh, let us go to him. I may be able to talk to him. Which way? Which is the way? Hi. Ma, Amma, Minglava, Seguji. But if I got in, I said to my me, I'm the. Eh? Said to my. During war, were you here? Uh, headman, headman, I, I used to come. You give me rice. Tell them that Indian soldier. They used to give us sheep, yeah. uh, chicken, chicken that's why, yeah. tomato, yeah, tomato, and uh, yeah. aloo. Yeah. You used to give us. Jesu Timade. Jesu Timade. What does she say? She remembers. Yeah. In his final speech on the eve of his departure from Burma on April the 24th, 1945, Netaji had concluded by saying, the day will come when free India will repay the debt of gratitude to the people of Burma for all the help that I have received in carrying on this struggle. Finally, Colonel Dillon is able to express his gratitude, though half a century later. The Japanese resistance at Maiktila ended at dusk on March the 3rd, 1945. Slim had his wrist. The general could now barely wait to clear the Irrawaddy Valley of all opposition in order to hasten his arrival in Rangoon before the monsoon. He mounted a three-pronged attack on the INA at Popa. In the north from Tangta, in the west from Nyangu, and in the east from Maiktila. On March the 30th, Colonel Prem Segel took up positions seven miles north of Popa. It was here, in Leji, that the bloodiest battle was to be waged. I know how important the battle of Leji was to, in the INA campaign. Colonel Seigel used to talk about it very frequently and so much so that our first house in Kanpur after we got married was called Leggy. So of course when anybody asked why we had named it then he would explain all about the battle of Leggy. Because although it did not end in a victory for the INA, it was here that his officers and men performed exemplary acts of courage and bravery, many of which ended in their laying down their lives during the battle. And this was a source 
of great inspiration for him and he felt that the honor of the INA which had been besmirched by a few desertions was fully vindicated by the bravery of these officers and men at the Battle of Leji. British and for that matter Indian military historians pay little attention to the confrontation at Leji. In the ranks of the INA though, not only is the Battle of Leji a matter of pride, it is looked upon as an unqualified success. One lightly armed battalion with no artillery and no air support faced and resisted an entire brigade. When Prem Saigal finally withdrew from his positions on April the 4th, it was not defeat that prompted his retreat, rather the fact that his battalion had almost ceased to exist. On April the 25th, 1945, Colonel Prem Kumar Saigal was captured by the British. Shah Nawaz and Dhillon were to follow him on May the 17th. Their war was over, though none in their hearts nor in their minds would acknowledge it. Three months later, Shah Nawaz, Segal and Dillon were placed on trial before a court-martial in Delhi's Red Fort for waging war against the British sovereign. The British censors had managed successfully until then to black out all news about the existence of the Freedom Army. When the truth dawned on the Indian people, there was an outcry throughout the country. General Orkinley, the British Commander-in-Chief, found himself on the horns of a dilemma. He couldn't possibly court-martial an entire army. Equally, as Commander-in-Chief, he couldn't overlook the actions of soldiers who had preferred to abandon the British Union Jack for the Indian flag. The British could no longer take the loyalty of their Indian troops for granted. And yet, without the British Indian Army, the Raj would not have survived. As their trial began, Shah Nawaz Khan, Prem Kumar Sagal and Gurbak Singh Dhillon must have worn secret smiles. In their own way, they had in fact completed the march on Delhi. Indians who will be born not as slaves but as free men, because of your colossal sacrifice, will proudly proclaim to the world that you, their forebears, fought and lost the battle, but through temporary failure paved the way to ultimate success and glory. The darkest hour always precedes the dawn. India shall be free, and before long.